This morning, um, we are delighted uh, to have Mr. Anthony Cupola with us. We're equally divided, or delighted to have his wife Peggy with us, who um, joined him on Friday evening in, in a wonderful discussion. Uh, Saturday, Tony uh, was a delight to members of the Presbytery, our, our regional body of churches. Uh, and led a discussion on um, what it is to be followers of, of Jesus Christ, what it is to be disciples. Um, this morning he will challenge us yet again. Um, I, you know, I often wonder how do you how do you introduce people, and there are some people that simply do not need to be introduced, and, and Tony is one of those. We know him as a, uh, first and foremost as a, a man of personal faith in Jesus Christ. We know him as a biblical scholar. We know him as a theologian. Uh, we know him as a sociologist. Um, I, I got to know him last night as a dinner companion. And, uh, therefore, I got to know them both as delightful conversationalists and wonderful human beings. Um, we know him as a gifted teacher. Uh, and we know him as an incredible witness. His life bears out the fruit of Christ, uh, not only in word, but in deed. Uh, so with that, I simply would like to offer a prayer, and then I'm going to get out of the way because uh, we have delight in store for us this evening. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is your spirit we seek this morning, on this Sabbath day, as we gather as the community of faith to worship you, to praise you, to glorify you, and to rededicate our lives to the service of Christ our Lord. We ask your anointing upon Tony this morning as he teaches, as he shares his stories, as he makes us laugh, and as he makes us think, as he challenges us even as he encourages us. Bless him in this hour. And through him, bless us. And in our blessing, help us to know that we are to be a blessing to others. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Tony, thank you. Welcome again. Good to be here. And introductions are always funny to listen to when you're being introduced, you know. By the time you finished, I could hardly wait to hear what I had to say. You know? <laughs> that I've had, among the better ones, uh, uh, one of my friends introducing me said that the length of the introduction usually denotes the significance of the person. Uh, the shorter the introduction, the more important, the more significant the individual. For instance, when the President of the United States speaks, there's never a long introduction. The announcer simply says, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Pause and he said, Tony Campolo was born in February. <laughs> One of the others it was equally uh, wonderful. I was speaking at a, at a college, and the woman that was introducing me, I was sitting there, and she started going, well, I want you to get to know a person who has changed my life, who has impacted me, uh, who has nurtured a love between us over the years. I, I want you to meet a person who speaks truth with eloquence. And went, I'm, I'm, I'm dying over there. And she said, of course I'm talking about Jesus. And now Tony Campolo will say a little more about it. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Uh, this is a difficult one for me, because I like to preach, I like to teach, but uh, to suggest that I know the answers to questions uh, about how a church should relate to a community is very difficult for me for two reasons. Number one is I don't know your community. I, I don't live around here. Uh, I live in a very different kind of community. So to talk about, hey, we're going to connect with the community, how do we reach out, how do we uh, nurture the uh, people in this neighborhood, in this community, in this city for Jesus Christ is difficult. All I can do is tell you what other churches are doing because I get to travel around and I see a lot of unique things, a lot of special things. Uh, and uh, 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 having this uh, high school across the street 
for instance, is a very interesting uh, thing. And there are ways of relating to high schools. Uh, some people do it uh, with athletics. You know, uh, uh, the, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes has, has had a great opportunity to get into high schools. Uh, they go to the games, they connect with the people. Young Life does the same sort of thing. Uh, these are uh, parachurch organizations who have done incredibly good jobs. And I think that the first thing that I would have to say is that a church like this, uh, mainline denominational church, uh, has a problem in that over the years, mainline denominations uh, have always looked with sub suspicion on parachurch groups like Young Life, like Fellowship of Christian Athletes, which is an incredible mistake. Uh, the attitude is, well, those groups are extremely <coughs> fundamentalist. Well, I have to tell you this. When I was growing up, I grew up in a very fundamentalist setting. I actually think that fundamentalism is a very good stage. I, I, did you notice I said stage? I hope, I hope people don't stay there. But when I was 15 or 16 or somewhere around there, 14, 15, 16, 17, fundamentalism was really helpful to me in that it had a whole array of rules and regulations. Uh, you know, you don't, you don't do this, you don't do that, you don't do the other thing. But it kept me from screwing around. It, it kept me from a lot of things that uh, uh, would have destroyed me. I think that uh, at a particular stage in life, you almost need rules and regulations. I think there has to come a time when you begin to question those rules and regulations and wonder whether these are the essence of Christianity. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, if they are still in that mold, that their religion is simply an array of rules and regulations, uh, I think they're very spiritually immature. Very spiritually immature. I mean, you've got to go beyond rules and regulations. Uh, you've got to, in fact, uh, learn to live out love. And sometimes love moves beyond rules and regulations. Sometimes love uh, requires that you do things that you, when you look back on them, you say, how could I have possibly done that? Uh, for instance, I, uh, I'm friends with a very famous, uh, I won't mention her because I'm going to tell a story about her, very famous nun, Catholic nun, who does an incredible work in Chicago. And, uh, and she's particularly notable for working with the prostitutes on the street. And, and uh, uh, here was this one woman sitting on the steps crying, and he, she went over and she said, What's the matter? Well, this woman gotten old, and a couple of teeth had fallen out. And somebody banged her around uh, while she was prostituting, and uh, and uh, she was she she was beyond the stage where she was attractive, and uh, in a sexual way, uh, in a sexual way, and then she was running out of money, and she had no business, and nobody wanted her anymore. And she's crying because nobody wanted to sleep with her anymore. And this nun uh, said, I, uh, we sat down and we talked and we prayed. And I found myself praying that the Lord help her to get some more customers. And I, <laughs> this, this is not what a nun should be doing, you know. But, but, and she said, I stopped in the middle of it and realized what I was doing. But nevertheless, you can sense this empathy that this nun had for this woman. And, and this feeling that, hey, uh, you know, we, we, have to, we have to feel where people are and respond to them and their needs. And this was what she needed at this time. It wasn't particularly good for her, you know. But uh, these are very, very uh, important things. Love uh, requires that you move uh, beyond uh, rules and regulations and that you take some risks. Uh, the... Uh, but when I was a youngster in high school, uh, this was very important to me. And secondly, uh, when I was in high school, Young Life, I didn't belong to a thing like Young Life. They called it Bible Buzzards. <laughs> Bible Buzzards. <laughs> um, and out of the Bible Buzzards, this group of about 30 young people who would meet for Bible study in their neighborhood, led by a, a man, Tom Root, who was, a, uh, was an accountant. Uh, I mean, there's a story of a layman. Uh, there are about 30 of us. I think about 20 of us are in some form of church ministry right now. 
um, either as missionaries or ministers. I could name three people who went on from that little Bible study group to become professors of theology in seminaries. One is a seminary president. Uh, I think there were seven who became missionaries in third world countries. Uh, impacted dramatically. Was the group fundamentalist? Yes. Are any of us fundamentalists today in the sense of the old time rigid? The answer is no. Uh, but at that stage, uh, this was the thing to do. I mean, uh, we studied Philippians, we studied Ephesians, we stu and we, we knew these verses and we, we, we pronounced them. And I remember the, I belong to a mainline denomination. And <laughs> Here, 
who would deny that Jesus said, you want to be my disciples? 10th chapter of Mark. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and take up the cross and follow me. Anybody here done that? I saw the cars in the parking lot. <laughs> Sell everything and give it to the poor and take up the cross and follow me. Incidentally, there's a whole group of young men and women uh, that have come out of Eastern who have literally taken that to task and, and have, in fact, given everything they have to the poor. Uh, and uh, it, it, they're an amazing group and they've gotten international fame. Uh, this group is called The Simple Way. And uh, they are in Philadelphia, the worst slum in Philadelphia, uh, giving to the poor, working for the poor, nurturing the poor in the name of Jesus Christ. And they've had an incredible impact not only on their own community, but they've had an incredible impact across the world. It's, it's an amazing group of people. Uh, and uh, they have decided to do this. Uh, I, I, here's the good news. You do do some good news. I don't have to tell Presbyterians the good news. Here's the good news. You're not saved because you are living the life that you ought to be living. You're saved because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Amen? Amen. Yeah. I mean, it's what Jesus did for you uh, that really that assures you of your salvation. That's what the whole Reformation was about. And we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you can't go around and say, I am a Christian. Uh, by saying, I live the life. Because they look at you and they say, you're not living the life. I always love that line by Lenny Bruce, one of America's foremost comedians. Foul mouth, dirty talking Lenny Bruce, who said about the clergy, whenever I meet a minister who has two coats, I know I'm dealing with a hustler. <laughs> Stop to think about that. I mean, what did Jesus say? If you have two coats, what should you do? God, you see, but you don't do it, do you? You don't do it. You have more than one coat. You weren't wearing the same jacket yesterday. I noticed that. <laughs> uh, the, uh, when you say grace, I always like to explain grace. I, and I think one of the best illustrations of grace is uh, my son, who is really very good with working with young people. I mean, uh, if you had him as your youth minister, the place would be packed with young people. He is a pie piper. Uh, he, he's working in Cincinnati, in the slums of Cincinnati, uh, trying to live out the gospel there as a missionary in that setting. But let me just say that uh, Bart was in Philadelphia, and he had a huge program with about 20 churches working together. Uh, small churches, he figured, he, I mean, kids love a big youth group. So he put a big youth group together of the toughest inner city kids you could have possibly imagined. He took 250 of these guys, they were guys, up into the Pocono Mountains for a weekend retreat. Bart is great at getting kids to follow him. Not careful about details. <laughs> 250 kids up there tearing the place apart. And there's only two counselors. <laughs> and what's worse is he's running late and hasn't arrived. <laughs> and they're tearing the place apart. The cell phone rings. He, he answers it. And he's like, killing, the, killing us up here. You get up here. What's going on? There's only two of us here to take care of 250 kids. You've got to be crazy. Bart hangs up the phone. He's driving. He's got this van full of kids. Luggage on the roof. Luggage in the back. He's doing it the best he can. Boom. A blowout on one of the tires. Pulls the van over to the side. Jacks up the van, gets all the kids out, gets all the luggage out so he can get to the spare tire. He's got the, got the van jacked up, and the, jam, and the thing slips off the jack and smashes to the ground. And my son let loose with a religious statement that had no theological <laughs> You know what I mean? You got a picture. On the way home, this white kid says, hey man, this was the weekend I did it. You know, you've been after me to, you know, to make my decision to become a Christian. Well, I decided to become a Christian this weekend. Bart was elated. What, what did it? You know, he wanted to know whether it was a speaker, the new Bible study, what prayer group, what was it? Oh, none of that stuff. It was on the way up here. When the van slipped off the jack and you said all that stuff you shouldn't have said, I figured then, if he could be a Christian, anybody could be a Christian. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you, this is the way it is. 
But uh, young people are very, very sensitive to the fact of the incongruities between what the church uh, does and what its people are, as opposed to what Jesus is all about. And that gave birth to a group of young people, which now is expanding exponentially at a rate that I couldn't possibly imagine. Um, it's called the Red Letter Christian Movement. I wear a little wristband. You've noticed my little wristband. Really? Did you notice the wristband? You think you're the only one that wears wristbands. I wear wristbands too. So don't mess with me, baby. <laughs> the, the, truth, the truth is, uh, Red Letter Christianity is a group of people who decided to take the Red Letters of the Bible seriously. Which is quite incredible. Take the Red Letters of the Bible seriously. There's something. You know, the Red Letters being the words of Jesus that are highlighted in red. And uh, uh, they're quite radical. And so uh, they're constantly doing this. They're constantly asking, uh, what do the red letters really say? What do they expect us to do? And uh, they take seriously the teachings of Jesus who says, uh, you are my disciples if you do whatsoever I command you. If you love me, you will do whatsoever I command you. And these guys and these women say, that's what we're going to do. We're going to take Jesus at his word. So when Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, they become serious. We, we have a whole group of young men who are in a subsidiary of this group called the Centurions. These are all soldiers, officers in most cases, uh, who were in Iraq, who have resigned their commission because they decided that you couldn't read the Sermon on the Mount and come out as a soldier who would kill people. They, they just, they, they see an incongruity here. I'm, I'm here, I'm in Iraq, I'm killing people, and this is not even the old-fashioned war where soldiers killed soldiers, we're killing civilians. We're not going to do this anymore. So they resign, and they, we're going to take you, you say, this is radical stuff. Of course it's radical stuff. When the war in Iraq broke out, a whole gang of them drove across the desert to Baghdad, rented two vans, drove across the desert to Baghdad, so that they could work in the hospitals when the bombing started. And there they were, patching up wounded people, wiping away tears, taking care of the wounded, trying to say to these Muslim people who think that the army is a rebirth of the Crusades, no, this is what Christianity is about. We're here, but you're our enemies. We love our enemies. We will do good to those who have hurt us. Our Bible says if your enemy hungers, you feed him. If he's naked, you clothe him. If he's sick, you care for him. We believe this stuff. And the impact that they have made in Iraq, as some of them went back to say thank you to one particular village. And what happened was that they, they, they continued to serve in Baghdad, uh, taking care of the wounded from the bombing until the U.S. troops got to Baghdad. At that point, they were ushered out of Baghdad at gunpoint. And they got in the vans, and they're driving back across the desert. And one of the vans uh, it blow, has a blowout on the, on the tire, and the van rolls over three or four times. Uh, serious injuries to the young men and women who were in the van. The other van, which was in front of them, noticed in the rearview mirror uh, that the second van wasn't there. So they turned around and went back, and here they found the van empty, blood all over the place. And they thought the worst, the only thing they could think of is maybe somebody took them back to the village that was down the, that they had previously come from because there was only one road between Baghdad and, uh, and uh, uh, Jordan. So they go back to this village, and yes, that's where the young people were. An Iraqi patrol. In the midst of this war, these soldiers came upon this van, saw these kids lying there, broken arms, horrible wounds, picked them up, stopped their fighting, picked them up, took them to the hospital and took care of them, and uh, nursed them back to health. They stayed there for a while and were cared for in typical Arab hospitality. And. Uh, Last year, a group of them went back. They say, how did they get back? They went to Jordan. They got papers from the king of Jordan so that when they got to the border, they wouldn't be stopped. 
And they went back and the whole village was in a state of celebration that their friends had come back to them. That's the kind of impact you can make if you really live out the red letters uh, of the Bible. I mean, these kids make an incredible impact. I'm not sure we're ready to do that. As I said, thank God we're saved by through faith, not works, lest any one of us should boast. But here's some of the things that I, I have seen. Let's, let's take this high school across the street. How, how would you impact that high school? I talked about the power church organizations. Undoubtedly, they're working in the high school. You need to make connections with them. That they feed people from that program into the church. Uh, that's what these groups should be. They should be feeder programs for the church. But the second thing you should do is have task forces. For instance, the last thing that young people need across the street is to be entertained. Now, Ernest, Ernest Becker, in a classic book, uh, Denial of Death, I think most uh, academics read it. Have you read it, Pastor? You've got to get the book. I'm not an academic. Well, you would. <laughs> you get more sermon material out of the book. Then I read it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Saturday night, you're a desperate man, right? You've got to tell us Go to the book, Denial of Death. It's a neo Freudian, neo Marxist author who won the Pulitzer Prize because this book is so good. But as he talks about young people, this guy who is hardly a member of the God Squad says this, when will the church realize that youth was made for heroism and not for pleasure? Let me just say that again. Youth was made for heroism and not for pleasure. And I'll tell you what mainline churches think, that youth was made for pleasure. And if they could just put a ping pong table up at a, a pool table and, and say it's open for you to come and play pool and ping pong, that you're going to really electrify the high school. Oh, yawn. <laughs> Suppose you went over there and said, after the earthquake in Haiti, we're going to round up three teams to go down to Haiti to clean up rubble, to help rebuild the houses, to take care of the people there who are in desperate straits. We want to recruit. You did this in the school and seven. Didn't even mention the name Jesus. Didn't even, because you can. They won't let you. We're here to recruit people to come and join us because we're going to Haiti. And some of you adults become the people who go along with these kids. To go to Haiti, to build a house, to, to put a family back together again, to, to uh, fix up a school, to do the, I guarantee you, you go over next door to this high school, and you say you want to come to a youth church meeting, they will not come. You say you want to go and help the people in Haiti after this earthquake, they will line up. They will line up. And this is your chance. And you folks who are here have to be willing to get on the plane and fly down. You've got to work with them with car washes and cake sales or whatever you have to do to raise the money. But you get these kids involved in a vision that will challenge them into doing something heroic. Something they will remember the rest of their lives. To be able to come back to high school and say, you can't believe what it's like down there. You cannot believe the sufferings. As a matter of fact, uh, my school is an American Baptist school. And they credit me for having shaped the school's ethos. And they say, how did you do this? Because Peggy remembers when I was the... Uh, chaplain of the school, and I gave that up and became the sociologist of the school. But the thing I began to do was just simply recruit young people to go to Haiti, to go into the inner city, to work among the poor, doing tutoring after school, to do all kinds of stuff like that. And all of a sudden, people began to become radicalized for Jesus Christ. I always brag over the fact that 3% of the students coming, coming into Eastern uh, in, as freshmen, uh, say they want to go into a church vocation, pastor it, but most of them talk about uh, foreign missionary stuff. 3%, 18% of our graduates are committed to these things. Generally, Christian colleges destroy people's faith. I mean, I don't have to tell you guys this. I, I don't know how many of you are graduates of Worcester or graduates of Muskegon, but uh, you, you know what happens in these religious schools. 
Uh, you know, they get into uh, biblical criticism, J-E-P-T, and, you know, they're not sure about this, and the God is dead theology. Jeez, the kids are ruined by the time they come out. Uh, our president says that in most Christian colleges, they citadels of spirituality because the kids bring so much faith in, and the seniors take so little of it out, and just kind of piles up in the place. Uh, but get kids involved in something heroic. Uh, you bring them back from there, you can go into stage two, and this stage two is a simple one. It's a very, very simple one. Namely, they realize you don't have to go to the third world to go to the third world. That's right here in the Canton Acton area. It, it, would you not agree? The poverty, the broken homes, the uh, disintegrating lives of young people, it's all around. And so you begin to... And, and when you're down there in Haiti, you work all day, but in the evening you have these sessions where you unpackage things and you think things through. We have a whole team down there that does nothing more than, in fact, help people come down and participate in ministry in Haiti. Uh, and then help them to think through these issues. And then, in fact, to say, when you get back home, you don't have to come down here to help the poor. Uh, you can do it right there. I, I just want to give one little story that will kind of pick up this stuff. Uh, one of my friends is a pastor. Had a woman uh, come in, uh, and uh, her husband had left her. And she was like uh, 48, 49, and, and her husband had left her. And uh, he, there was a good settlement, so there was a lot of money left behind. And of course, my pastor said, I, I suppose he left you for a younger woman. To which she said, of course, anybody his own age would have seen right through him. <laughs> but uh, the pastor suggested that she go and work with Mother Teresa. You know, she had all kinds of money. She didn't have any need to uh, go out and, and be employed uh, in the workplace where she could earn money. So she wrote to Mother Teresa. And nothing happened for a month, a month and a half, two months. And then in a brown envelope, handwritten, came a note from Mother Teresa that said, Dear Carol, find your own cow cutter. Love, Mother Teresa. That's a good line. You don't have to come over to Calcutta. But it's good to go to Calcutta. It's good to go to Haiti because there you get sensitized. Uh, you get sensitized in, in ways... When young people come and work in our programs in the inner city, we recruit young men and women like you, in case you didn't know why you're here. <laughs> you don't have to go and work with us in the summer, but if you don't, <laughs> terrible things will happen to you. The fleas, as Johnny Carson would say, the fleas of a thousand cows will look best your armpits. Do we understand? <laughs> but we recruit young people to come and work in the inner city. And it works out quite well. Uh, but the, the thing is that mothers always ask me the very simple question. Here's the question. Isn't it dangerous in Philadelphia? Isn't it dangerous where you're going to send my kid to work? When they come in and see where these kids are going to work, they really tremble. We, we ask them not to bring their kids, to send their kids by airplane, bus, or train, because if the mothers see these neighborhoods and say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not letting you out here. And I always respond the same way. You think it's dangerous here? I'll tell you what's dangerous. Dangerous is raising your kid in that affluent American suburb where they're surrounded by consumer goods and where shopping centers become the places of entertainment. That's what's dangerous. Because the Jesus that you find in the red letters says, don't be afraid of those who would hurt your body. Worry about those who will hurt your souls. And I worry about what kids become seduced into our American affluent upper middle class lifestyle. I wonder what happens to them because it does stifle their spirituality. And if you think otherwise, you haven't done much sociological observation. So that's the first thing I will say. The second thing I will say is this. We recruit college students, about 150 a year from colleges and universities all across the country which is one of the reasons why I came out here, so I could speak at Malone. Good place to recruit people, uh, zealous people. So we recruit, and they come and work with us during the summer months. Some stay on for a year. The reality is that uh, 
we, we recruit these people. But I've often thought, why do we have to do this? I look at a church like this and I don't know how many college students are at least on your rolls. You know. Ten. Ten? That's great. That's a lot. <coughs> Ten. When they come home during the summer, if they're typical college students, you probably cannot count on them showing up at church. Yeah, yeah I, I, he said that reluctantly. <laughs> by the time they get to college, they're not sure that going to church on Sunday is, is a good thing. It's not that they have anything against God. They just find the church is boring. Uh, you you who have kids, they, they find it boring. I, I, I love the story about um, eight or nine months ago that was on the evening news uh, nationally of a 10-year-old kid who had stolen his father's car. Did you remember this? And he was riding, he was speeding at 60 miles an hour on the freeway, 10-year-old kid in a car speed. And the cops finally caught up with him, pulled him over to the side. They, they came to the car. Do you remember this? The kid's crying. And he's saying, I don't want to go to church. I don't want to go to church. <laughs> church could do and should do. I think they need to, in fact, say to these kids, look, uh, we have a couple of, of several housing developments around here. What we'd like to do is, is organize the ten of you to work in, ten is exactly the right number, in this particular housing development for the summer. We want you to, we want you to live in this, we're going to rent a house, and you're all going to live together in this house. And we're going to because they need to understand the joys of living in community and working through the tensions of living in community. They have lived very individualistic lives. Uh, the size of the American family is down to 1.94 children per family. Jeez. Every time I give that figure, my son says to my daughter, you are the point, not four. <laughs> but the families are very, very small. Kids are very, very individualistic. Uh, they, they live as individuals. They have their own rules. They have never had to live uh, where they have to get along with others their own age. And so they live in community. You have devotional time. This is where they really grow spiritually, in community, reading scripture, praying together, and all of this kind of stuff. Very strict discipline established spiritually. Spiritual disciplines are exercised. They go out and they knock on doors in the beginning of the summer and say, we're going to be running a summer program and we'd like your children to be a part of it. I guarantee you, you will get an incredible response in the government housing project because mothers are worn out. A lot of them have to go to work. Their husbands have already left. Their husbands are gone. Uh, you've got single parent homes all over these uh, government housing projects. During the school year, at least they figure my kids in school. During the summer, what, what, what happens, they're going to run wild. And the mother knows the kids are going to run wild. And you come and you say, we're going to run a summer program from 9 in the morning until uh, 5 in the afternoon. We'd like to have your kid be a part of it. You're going to get a very positive response. Ten kids can handle about 150 uh, inner city children. About 150. Uh, and uh, uh, that's about the ratio you want to go at. You don't want to go beyond that. Because this is going to take a lot of attention, a lot of time, and a lot of energy. Both my granddaughters, uh, grandchildren, my grandson, my granddaughter, uh, worked in Camden last, uh, last summer. Uh, it, it has a transformative effect on them. Uh, I'm amazed at how many people become Christians simply by participating in this kind of program. My best illustration is I was lecturing at the University of Manchester in England. And I was talking, it was in the sociology, I was in, in, invited by the sociology department. We were talking about urban life in America. When it was over, these two young men came up and said, we'd like to work in your summer program this coming summer as missionaries with you. And I said, great, we, we need everybody we can get. Uh, they said, before you jump at this, uh, let, let me tell you that we're, we're both agnostics. And neither of us really have, we're not, we're not sure whether there is a God or isn't a God, we don't know. And so we're not Christians. Uh, can we still be missionaries? <laughs> it took me like that long to say, yeah, on one condition. That all summer long you pretend you're a Christian. 
You, you know, you go to the Bible studies, you go to worship on Sunday, you take the kids with you to church, uh, you, you know, you play games, you teach them gospel songs and all this stuff. I need not tell you the rest of the story, do I? Today, both of those guys are Anglican priests in the United Kingdom. They were totally transformed by their involvement. You see, we have this concept called praxis in sociology. The problem with Presbyterians is they're far too rational. You have been imbued with Socratic concepts of education. Socrates, Plato said this. Plato particularly said, the way you change people is you appeal to their thinking. And what they think controls what they feel, and what they feel determines what they do. That's, that, that's what Plato taught. Uh, you know, so everything has to, be, has to start with the intellect, which is crazy when you stop to think about it. You got a problem with kids across the street at the high school screwing around sexually? I know what we need. We need more sex education. Let me break it to you. They could educate you. <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. Or the other one is you got a drug problem. You know what we need? We need a program in the high school that will educate kids on the dangers of drugs. And some cop comes in and says, kids, you know, drugs could become addictive. <laughs> These kids look at each other and say, did you hear that, Charlie? I had no idea that you were totally unaware of this. I mean, how stupid can we be? I mean, there's... We, and, and the more we introduce these programs, the worse the situation gets. Agreed? The point is very simple. People are somewhat changed by what they think. I'm not suggesting that what you think does not influence your behavior. What I want to say to you, that praxis, a sociological concept, says, while thinking influences behavior, it is far more likely that your behavior controls your thinking. I, for instance, when I was working as a college chaplain, I, I, every once in a while some kid would come in and sit down and say, I don't believe in God anymore. I came here believing in God, but I've stopped believing in God now. Can you help me? My first question was, how long have you been sleeping with your girlfriend? He says, I came here to ask a very serious question. <laughs> I, said, I said, of course. I said, let me tell you what happened. You came out of a fundamentalist church. That's right, I did. And they had certain rules and regulations of do's and don'ts. Isn't that true? Yeah. And screwing around was not acceptable. It was a don't. Don't have sex before marriage. I grew up on that, right? Singing a little song. Be careful, little hands, what you do. You do not know this song. You've been brought up in a Presbyterian church. There's the liturgy here. I'm a, I'm a Baptist. We got careful with your hands what you do. God is, you know the song. Yes, bless your heart. God is up above. He is looking down and look. You've got the motions, right? So be careful with your hands. That song ruined my dating life. I mean, I mean, I'm ready to make a move on the girl and I hear this boy from heaven say, be careful with your hands. I mean, it was that way. So I said to him, come out of this church where, you know, messing around sexually is such an evil thing. You come here to school, you get hooked up with this girl, you're screwing around, and your behavior is in contrast to your belief system which hasn't changed. In fact, you are experiencing what a psychologist would call cognitive dissonance. There is a break between your action and your beliefs. Now, one of two things have got to happen. Either you give up your faith in God, so that you won't feel guilty about what you're doing, or you'll give up what you're doing and be in harmony with God. There are your two choices, and it's obvious that you've made yours. You've decided that I can't go on with this cognitive dissonance uh, between what I believe and what I do, so I'll change what I believe so it doesn't in fact make me feel guilty about what I do. That's the way it works in this world. Actions control your thinking more than you realize. And so if you can get your college kids to come in the summer, work in one of these government housing projects, and pass it, we have a whole system, we can teach you how to do it, we're doing it all over the country, it'll impact that community, but that's not the most important part, strangely enough. It'll impact that community significantly. 
Uh, we were just a couple of nights ago uh, in seeing a program put on by these inner city kids in Camden which blow your mind in terms of the depth. And, and they had some adults there who had been changed by the program and gave their testimony. It was wonderful. But that's not the only thing. Nothing will change these ten young men and women who work in this slum area for a summer. Suddenly Christianity makes sense to them. Suddenly it has a meaning, it has a purpose. And as they try to communicate Jesus to others, they themselves are transformed. If you were here on Friday night, you heard my wife's testimony. And she said, I, I thought I was a Christian, I pretended to be a Christian, until I had to share my faith with a woman that was dying. And the more I shared my faith with her, the more I became convinced that this was the truth of the gospel. Namely, what we do controls, uh, you know, what we, what we feel and what we think. Uh, more than we realize. So that's another thing that the church can do. So first of all, task forces for high school kids. Uh, you have summer programs. I mentioned the other day uh, that as a church like this, uh, I, I don't know who lives in walking distance of this church or what you have, but I, 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 don't, I can't speak to this community. I told the group the other day about a uh, Baptist church in, uh, in, uh, in England, uh, in Chelmsford. Uh, which is packed out on Sunday morning with old people because they began to run programs on getting people ready to die if you need help in, in, uh, in, in, in getting your will in order. Uh, do you need help in getting your paper straightened out? Uh, most women uh, uh, become... It, it's going to be the other way in our house. If anything happens, I keep saying to Peggy, please, let me die first, please. Because I don't know where anything is. I don't know where, where our money is in the bank. I don't, as a matter of fact, she forges my signature so often that I tried to go and get a check cashed. And the lady, right, the lady at the bank said, uh, who are you? I said, I'm, I'm Tony Campos. So he's right there. She goes back and asks them. This doesn't look like uh, Tony Campos' handwriting. <laughs> you know, and the truth is that the people are... You know, most people who are widowed or widowers, they don't know what to do because there's a whole array of things that they were unprepared to handle that the other person of marriage handled. Stop to think of it. As you look over, you're probably looking at each other and saying, you're, he's a big friend. The guys particularly. I mean, I don't even know how to do the income tax. I've never filled out the income tax since we were married. She always takes care of it. Bless your heart. <laughs> and it always gets in late. <laughs> Uh, but programs for the elderly, uh, trips into, uh, into Cleveland to the theater, uh, to programs like that, very, very helpful. Um, the next thing to say, and I'm going to end this quickly, uh, the workplace. Uh, we have a friend um, uh, who, who ended up in a church in, in uh, the upper uh, west side of Manhattan. And uh, Gordon McDonald, he's written a lot of books. Some of you have written some, read some of Gordon McDonald's books. But he ends up at this church in the Upper West Side. And uh, he realizes that the people in the community are not going to come to the church. Incidentally, I think a good sermon title. What a good sermon title. You, you know that line of, uh, of uh, Elvis Presley at the end of an Elvis Presley concert? What did, they always, what did you always hear coming over the yell-out speaker? Elvis has left the building. It should be, the uh, sermon title is, The Church Has Left the Building. Yeah, that, that's a, good, that's a good, good thing. The church has left the building. Uh, because uh, this is what the church should do. And so what he would do is he would go into, get one of his uh, parishioners who happened to be uh, maybe a businessman on Wall Street. He had a great impact on Wall Street, which was, uh, you know, at the other end of Manhattan. But uh, we'd go and say to one of these guys, are there five or six or seven people uh, in your office uh, that would like to have a Bible study at lunch hour, uh, you know, an extended lunch hour for, you know, an hour and a half or so, and we'll eat lunch together and talk about the things of God. Would you, you know, there's some people that you work with who would do that, and I'll come down and I'll, you know, I'll participate with you. And he, he had a whole slew of these Bible studies going on all over uh, Manhattan, uh, you know, where, I mean, if you're waiting, 
You see, we have this concept. It's a stupid concept. I call it the Field of Dreams concept. How many saw the movie Field of Dreams? Yeah, it's a very famous movie. And the theme that you heard over and over again was what? Build it, and they will come. That's the typical Presbyterian church. Build it, and they will come. If we build a gym, young people will come. If we build this, other people will come. Build this, build that. Build it, and they will come. They won't come. The Bible never said they would come. The Bible said you have to go. Go into all the world. Now, the pastor cannot go into the office where you work and say, I'm starting a Bible study. Would you like to come and hear me teach the Bible one day a week? No, would be the answer. <laughs> but if a guy or a woman working in the office, knowing people, uh, you know, says, we're going to have this group get together, would you, would you like to come and participate? And inevitably, the happen is that somebody will come in to work distraught one day. Her husband has left her, and she's broken. And you try to show sympathy, or somebody's kid has died, and suddenly this, look, why don't you come and join our, our group on Wednesday at lunch? Uh, maybe if we prayed together for you and your family and, and supported you uh, at this time of, of suffering. You, you would be amazed at the kind of response you would get. So you've got to get your lay people. I always, I mean, Presbyterians are big with that word, lay people. Uh, he's a layman. <laughs> well, the first time I heard that, I, I was in a Presbyterian church, a layman. I, I had this image of a dead pedestrian. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was a layman. But the, the, the reality is uh, that the Bible says that every Christian is a minister. And that you are called to go into these places, the workplace, the factory. Uh, in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, I, I became friends with a guy named Wayne Alderson. Anybody ever hear of Wayne Alderson or the value of the person? Uh, but what he, he was the president, he was the president of Pitron uh, Steel. And uh, he, uh, one day, he, he took over this company that was almost bankrupt. And uh, the tension between labor and management uh, was intense. As a matter of fact, Lefty Scamese, who was the guy who was the head of the uh, United Steelworkers Union, uh, had, a, had, had on his card, his name and address on the front, and on the back it said, that son of a bitch from the union. And you say, what? And I asked him why. He said, well, you, know, you go into the office, you give your card to the secretary and say, I'm here. And she goes in and says, Lefty Scamese is out there, and it was inevitable he said, oh, that son of a bitch would be you. <laughs> so, you know, he put it on the back so that way, when the guy could get the card, and he said, be sure to give him the card this way up, and the guy could look at it and start laughing, and that was a great way to start the conversation, you know, <laughs> laughing together. But uh, the interesting thing about uh, Wayne Olson is he, the first week on the job, he's wandering around and he runs across Lefty, he's on the line and says, Hey, I understand you're a very committed Catholic. He said, Yeah. He said, I'm a Presbyterian. What do you say the two of us get together once a week for Bible study and prayer? Oh, that'd be all right. Yeah. Next thing you know, they had three, four, five, ten, fifteen people. Soon the whole, the whole place was getting together. And of course the problems that emerged here, because you know labor and management aren't supposed to be friends. And Wayne said, I knew I crossed the line when my wife was seriously ill in the hospital. And the wives of labor union members started visiting her. I knew he crossed the line. Can we take it into the workplace? Our time is up. I can tell by the way you stood. <laughs> body language is everything. And, I mean, you know you're in trouble when the minister is going. <laughs> so thank you very much. I had a lot more good stuff to say. <laughs> there is no winning with him. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, the order of divine worship begins.
begins in 15 minutes. Uh, sanctuary, most of you know, is out the door to the right, all of you curves. Um, I realize there are several faces here uh, that are new, and we do welcome you with us, and we do hope you'll stay for worship. We also hope that our worship uh, nourishes your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and prepares you to go back out after the worship to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, with that in mind, we, we do end our time together. I thank you so much. Uh, it's it, three days with Amy's family. She's mom. I mean, it's what incredible people and what a blessing they've been to us. Um, Tony will be preaching this morning on the red letter words of the gospel. Um, let us move from here to sacred space, a different kind of sacred space, and worship the Lord. Oh, did I say one thing more? You may say one thing more. Is compassion still out there? Is that... Um, yes, it I, is. Yes, it is. Okay, here, say it. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. There's a display out there. They have little packets. Each of those packets has a picture of a kid in a third world country. For a dollar and a quarter a day, 38 bucks a month, you can clothe, educate, you can evangelize, uh, you can deliver the whole ball of wax to a kid in a third world country. Now, everybody says we've got to do something for the poor of the world. Well, I'm not sure I know how to completely transform the economies of third world countries so that poverty is eliminated. So I don't know exactly how to change the world. But I do know how to, you can change the world for one kid. I do know that. And the kid will write to you, you can write to the kid, you can visit the kid. I visit my kids because I travel a lot. Pick up a packet. There's a little form, and you, you fill out the form, and you leave it right there. The form's in the back, you tear off the one thing, fill it out with your name and address, leave it there. We will send you two things. We will send you compassion. I don't work for compassion. As a matter of fact, I want to be raising money for my own organization as we need it right now. But be this as it may, this is much more important to rescue a kid than to support a missionary organization. I will get money elsewhere. I don't need your money. <laughs> as a child in the third world country. So pick it up, fill out the form, leave it there. We'll take the forms with us when we leave today. And I'll send them on to Compassion. And, uh, and then I will say thank you to you by sending you a copy of my newest book, which just came out three days ago. That's right, which we've sold out already. Yeah, it's called The Red Letter Revolution. But here's what it looks like, so that you know the cover <laughs> wait, when wait, it comes wait, to you. Wait, I want to impress your daughter. Oh, I want to impress your daughter. Okay, you're ready to be impressed? Are, are you ready? No, tell them, are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Tell them who the first endorsement is. The first endorsement. Who? Who? Who's the two? Elizabeth. Yeah, that's right. Who, who endorsed it? Say it loud and clear for them. Bono. 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 <laughs> for those who are, are you impressed? Oh. Thank you. Um, let's go worship. 